Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the session, uh, Decarbonizing Transport by Influencing uh, Behaviors and Choices. My name is Jen Oh. I'm the Infrastructure Program Leader for the World Bank, and we'll be moderating this session today. Um, so yesterday and today, we, we talked a lot about and also listen to the ministers and mayors and others um, talking about what we need to do to decarbonize transport. Uh, we need to uh, electrify mobility, uh, develop clean fuels, and improve public transport and uh, non-motorized transport. In this session, we want to talk about um, how we can do this, right? Since uh, doing the above uh, requires um, many stakeholders doing their parts. You know, including the governments, uh, individual mobility users, uh, small and large businesses and financiers, operators, the list goes on. So what are some incentive mechanisms uh, that can influence the choices, uh, behaviors, behaviors and decisions of these many stakeholders? So the economists would say uh, introduce carbon pricing. Uh, but let's face it, I mean, that's not necessarily the most popular policy tool and have many practical constraints to introducing this in, in transport sector. So uh, we want to do two things. First, uh, we want to talk about where we are with carbon pricing uh, in transport sector and how effective they have been. And second, we, where we are heading um, and uh, in carbon pricing and more broadly uh, various incentive mechanisms to decarbonize the sector, and what are the key policy implications. So I'd like to start with Joe Pryor, um, our senior climate change specialist in the Climate Finance and Economics Unit of the World Bank, uh, where he's currently leading the development of the state and trends of carbon pricing uh, report. Uh, Joe has over 15 years of experience uh, in developing and implementing climate policies, and I invite him to spend a few minutes to walk us through the current state of carbon pricing and the application in transport sector. Hello, and welcome. So as, as Jen mentioned, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of carbon pricing in the transport sector. Um, I think it would be good to start off with some basics. What, what is carbon pricing? Um, and a very simple and general way to talk about it is it's about trying to align the, the cost of consuming carbon intensive fuels or undertaking emissions intensive processes or activities with the social cost of, of those activities or, or consuming those fuels. Um, now generally we can, we can sort of put these into two buckets, uh, direct carbon pricing and indirect carbon pricing. Um, indirect carbon pricing relates to, to those sort of policies that are uh, implemented not at uh, explicitly trying to target the, uh, the unpriced carbon externality. So these are things like fuel excises um, and, and uh, negatively the fuel subsidies, but also things like um, differentials in, in that uh, value, value added taxes. But I'm going to focus on direct carbon prices today, which are things like carbon taxes and emissions trading systems, which will be the focus of what I'll talk about. So the next few slides are just to give an overview about carbon pricing in, in the world um, and, and, and what, what countries and, and governments are currently doing for ETSs and taxes. Um, and these are all taken from the State and Trends Report um, of carbon pricing. So. Um, as you can see, the, around a quarter of, of global greenhouse gas emissions are covered by some form of ETS or, or carbon tax. And this is a, a nice sort of snapshot of all of the ETSs and taxes that are currently implemented, as well as those that are scheduled and under consideration. You can see a, a broad um, coverage, um, but as you'll as talk about later, um, a, a varying degrees of, of coverage in those countries and the price levels within those countries. Over the last few years, we've seen um, the, the price of, of carbon expressed through the allowance price and ETSs um, increase significantly. And that's particularly in the EU ETS, and this is through to uh, around April last year. But we've seen those price, price increases seem to have ma maintained over the last year, and in some cases, like in Europe, increased, where for the first time ever, the EU ETS price has exceeded 100 euros. Now, we've also seen tax uh, rates increase, and I think this is probably a more promising sign. 
because um, unlike allowance prices, uh, the tax rates are set by governments and therefore more reflective of what ambition is being, um, I guess, reflected by the government through those policies. And so this is a, an interest, a sort of just a, a, a cover of a, a select instruments. And not only are we seeing price rises, but we can see a few of the price trajectories uh, for a number of countries increasing over the, the short to medium term, particularly Canada and Ireland. And more recently, uh, Singapore and South Africa have announced um, increases to their carbon price tra trajectories. So while these are promising signs in terms of, of prices increasing um, and, and reaching levels that are required, generally the prices that have been implemented in, in mechanisms globally are below those prices required to achieve mitigation outcomes. And so this is a useful chart that shows uh, the relative prices across um, um, various jurisdictions that have implemented taxes and ETSs. Um, and so it shows that the divergence between the individual mechanisms, but it also shows through that grey band in the middle um, how they relate to the, the price that's estimated to be re required to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. And this carbon pricing corridor is essentially um, uh, the price that's been recommended by the High Level Commission on Carbon Prices um, to, of the levels required to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. And, and uh, what we've discovered is less than 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions are covered by a price that's in the range that's recommended to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. So now I've sort of provided a bit of an overview of where carbon prices are, so try and delve a little bit more about where is carbon pricing being applied in the transport sector and specifically looking at the road transport sector. And the majority of carbon taxes actually cover road transport. And, and this is largely because a, a lot of the carbon taxes are implemented through uh, applying a, a price to the carbon content on, on liquid fuels that are used in the transport sector. And so you can see that around two thirds or 24 of the 35 implemented um, carbon taxes are applied to, to, to road transport. Um, and that's across a range of, of regions, including in Europe uh, and as well as Asia Pacific, Africa and Latin America. And I think um, uh, they're implemented in different ways, uh, but, but it's important to note that it is actually already being applied through carbon taxes. Now, what's probably less known is that emissions trading systems are actually already applied to uh, the road transport sector. And this is a, a, a really useful figure generated by the International Carbon Action Partnership that track uh, the status and, and trends in, in um, and emissions trading systems. And what we can see um, through the, the red circle highlights is that there are already a number of emissions trading systems that are ap applied to road transport emissions. Now, this is generally applied through upstream uh, point of regulations. And this is an important point in terms of policy design. Unlike things like uh, electricity generation, it's very difficult to apply a carbon price to road transport at point sources. You're not going to make every uh, consumer or every um, um, vehicle uh, liable for its emissions. You apply it upstream to the point that the fuel enters the economy. Um, but we also know that, that, that it's applied broader than the road transport, fuel, uh, road transport sector and a number of uh, ETSs are already applied um, and to, to domestic aviation. So I guess the main point here is that carbon pricing is a useful tool um, and it's already been applied in a range of countries to achieve mitigation outcomes. So that was all focusing on direct or, or um, explicit carbon pricing, but I also wanted to touch on indirect carbon pricing. And this is largely in the form of um, fuel excise taxes and because it is an important uh, tool that can potentially provide an incentive to consumers in, in, a, in a country. And the data on screen is, is from um, an, an OECD report that was released last year. And over the last few years, the OECD has been tracking what they call implicit carbon pricing through, a, through a, um, a metric that they call effective carbon rates. And effective carbon rates have traditionally included energy taxes, so fuel excises, as well as carbon taxes and emissions trading systems. And last year, they also incorporated uh, fuel subsidies, which is a critical part of carbon pricing because uh, what really matters is the net incentive that's being applied to in the economy to users of, of fuel. And what this shows is, is a couple things. 
Um, but if you look at the road transport sector, the, the blue bars essentially represent the, the total effective carbon rate, which includes taxes, emissions trading systems, um, fuel taxes, and subsidies. And what you can see in the road transport sector is that the vast majority of the incentive, the effective carbon rate, is applied through indirect um, carbon prices. So that is through largely through the fuel excise system. And in comparison to the electricity sector, well, the vast majority of, of the carbon price, albeit smaller than the, um, the, the, the transport sector, is applied through direct or explicit carbon pricing instruments, so through carbon taxes or emissions trading systems. And this is a really important observation for policymakers in, in understanding, well, how have policymakers historically applied these incentives in the economy? And largely it's, it's through, through existing um, uh, taxes that are in place um, uh, due to artefacts not related to, to carbon pricing, not related to uh, uh, mitigation outcomes, but rather largely due to uh, revenue, trying to, trying to get uh, a, a revenue component um, from, from fuel use and, and transportation. So my main takeaway there is that carbon pricing is an important tool. But, but I also want to leave you with the, the fact that it's not the only tool and, and it's part of a policy mix. And, and importantly, there, there are other challenges beyond the unpriced carbon externality. And so these include market failures such as knowledge spillovers, imperfect information and network coordination failures. And I won't go into those in detail, but mainly just to, to highlight that there are other um, market failures that need to be addressed through other policies. Um, but also there are other challenges, and, and these are not unique to the transport sector, the road transport sector, but definitely um, highly prevalent in the sector. So particularly uh, uh, public resistance to new taxes or um, um, charges, and also the relatively inelastic demand of, of, of um, transportation fuels. And these are important things to be able to consider. And so lastly, this is just sort of a, uh, to, to sum up in terms of the, the policy suite that's available, um, carbon pricing is quite small on the screen, but carbon pricing is the top line there, an important policy tool, but a range of you know, categories of policies and different types within those that, that need to be, look, to be considered in terms of trying to adopt a, a sensible policy suite to target various market failures and to promote mitigation. And so this is dividing the mitigation opportunities in the trans road transport sector into three main buckets that people are, are probably familiar with in terms of avoid, shift and improve. Um, and then recognising the, the importance of carbon pricing, but also other policies such as ensuring that there is um, research and development into technologies to ensure that they're available for uh, consumers and users of fuels to be able to, to improve um, how they're using um, technology and, and, and the technologies available to them. Um, and the other key one here is ensuring that public policy and public investment in, in uh, public transport systems is, is um, sufficient to allow consumers to make those choices, those modal choices. So you're not just applying a punitive um, charge to, to consumers, but rather allowing um, uh, those incentives to, to allow consumers to make those decisions. So I'll leave it there and, and hopefully we have some, some time for discussion later. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, that was um, uh, that gave us excellent framework uh, to to think about the pricing incentives in transport. Now, I would like to invite our distinguished panel to the stage. So, if you could all come to the stage. We have a full house here, including uh, one one panelist connected connected as well. So I'll introduce each of you um, as I invite you to speak. And it'd be good to, if you could limit your respo first responses to two, uh, five minutes so we can have some conversation. Uh, Sinem, can you hear us? Yeah, great, okay. So I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Jifu Guo, um, the director of uh, Beijing Transport Institute with 30 years of experience in transport planning and management in one of the largest megapolises of the world, that is Beijing. He's also an adjunct professor at Beijing Transport University uh, and a member of advisory committee of the Minister of Transport of China. So uh, Dr. Guo, um, could you reflect on some of the pricing tools that we are discussing today? Uh, Beijing is uh, one of the most innovative cities in China when it comes to uh, transport policies, uh, adoption of e-mobility, uh, and yet experiencing very serious congestion issues. 
Uh, can you share with us how uh, Beijing's transport policies incentivize users to choose greener modes? Um, uh, thank you, Jay. Um, really, I've been uh, working 30 days in mitigating the congestion in Beijing. So it's really very hard to say uh, in a few minutes, right? <laughs> but recent years, we are uh, focusing not just the congestion, but also the decarbonizations. We, uh, we have uh, several traditional uh, strategies to uh, encourage people to use the greener transport mode, such as uh, planning side. We, uh, as you know, the, the city are still growing, okay? And uh, more people moving into the city, that means the travel distance, commuter distance is increasing, and the mobility needs are increasing. That means uh, the, the, the huge demand in the future we have to meet. Um, but however, however, we are uh, at the stage that the city is still growing, and at the same time, the regeneration of the, of the city. So we have uh, some efforts in, uh, to build the city, to change the layout of the city. We try to build the 15 minutes community life within a small area. And other efforts is to gen, uh, to to planning the the cities on the stations of the metro stations, okay, around the metro stations that make people use the metro system, public transit system more easily. Um, another way is the uh, we we call it is the, the the travel demand management, such as uh, the pricing, the parking. And uh, you know uh, we have also have a, a, a restriction of the car usage in the city uh, according to the, the 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 tail number of the of the license of the cars. Uh, Twenty percent the car usage were reduced per working days. Okay, uh, something like that. Uh, recent years we are introducing some more uh, innovative. Uh, methods to encourage people to use the more greener uh, transport mode. Um, I would like to introduce a little bit about this one. It's uh, called the Green Travel Initiative in, uh, uh, Incentive Initiative, which means that uh, if you walk, cycling, or using the public transit, we call the the, the internet uh, service provider to record the process of the of the travel, and then we we use the uh, 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 a method to calculate how many carbons will be reduced according to the baseline if the trip is made by the cars. Okay, so the the internet uh, service provider like the the navigator system here in uh, the, the the Google system, local one in China is uh, Autonavi or Baidu. Um, they calculate the reduction of the carbon and collect all the the carbon system is uh, uh, double check or, or validated by the third party. It's uh, our institute's rules, and then the the every process of the trips can be calculated directly according to the, the data tracked by the, 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 the parking, no, no, not the parking, the, the, the public transit system. You, you use the, the car, uh, so you can know uh, which station you, you, you get on and which station you get off. So the, the whole process can be recorded exactly. And all the carbons can be combined together and put onto the carbon trading system. So uh, for three years, we have been uh, collected more than two million people use the system, and more than 300,000 times carbon reduction trading or already in China. So that's an uh, uh, interesting one. And uh, uh, 
a survey data shows nearly 20% car users use this system during their other time not, not use the cars. So that means this kind of system can encourage people not to use the cars. Um, and about 10 million percent of the car users shift to the greener ways. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to think. In. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's an uh, uh, interesting case of using uh, traditional approaches to improve public transport, but also combining uh, use of technology uh, and incentive mechanism. I actually have many questions about this, but in the interest of time, uh, let me turn to Sinem uh, De Betas, the general manager of Sahil Hatlari, the Istanbul Ferry Company, a for, uh, former chairperson of the board of director of the Turkish Chamber of Marine Engineers. Uh, she brings her um, expertise and uh, perspective on decarbonizing waterborne transport. Sinem, um, decarbonizing waterborne transport is a, a complex feat. Uh, it involves uh, many uh, different stakeholders, shipbuilders, por port operators, fuel suppliers, and others. How do you see pricing incentives influence this complex ecosystem around water transport in Turkey? Uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, sincere thanks and a gratitude to organizers of this conference addressing such an important uh, issue considering that whole planet. You are making a great job and I hope these efforts result well. Uh, yes, this is really complex ecosystem and not easy to handle, uh, but with strong feasibility analysis and good planning, we can make it easier. Uh, and I would like to mention with uh, pleasure uh, that we have started these studies with the support of the World Bank to decarbonize the sea transportation in Istanbul. Uh, then your question reminds me a uh, promotion we offered to our passengers during the pandemic. We called it Beşkuruş in Turkish, which may be translated as free. Uh, usually the average price uh, a passenger has to pay for ferry services is approximately five Turkish liras. Uh, due to the loss of the passengers in the pandemic period, we offered uh, a 99 reduction in fees uh, and charge only 100 of the normal prices between uh, 10 a.m. and uh, 4 p.m., uh, which is off peak hours. Uh, this promotion costed us um, 80,000 Turkish lira a day, uh, which means approximately 4,000 uh, euro per day. Uh, but allowed us uh, to increase the percentage of the share of the series in total mass transportation in Istanbul uh, from 3% to 6 uh, The number seems to mean a doubling of the number of passengers, but in fact it is much more than that because they are obtained with respect to total number of passengers using mass transportation in Istanbul. Uh, the percentages um, increases much more than doubling if we compare the number of passengers who uh, prefer to use seaways or not when in seaways is an option. Based on this information, uh, changing the uh, system from diesel to electric, even if initial investment costs are high, uh, it means the operational costs will get down and we can decrease the fee of public transportation without any effort uh, and it helps to increase the ridership. From uh, this, I conclude that uh, even if it is not possible to renew all the mass transportation vehicles and if we manage to renew our ferry fleet uh, with prices incentives, it would be possible to increase the share of clean means of mass transportation that will contribute to decarbonization a lot. Uh, one of changes we made in maritime public transportation uh, this year we adopted mile-based pricing, while the fee for each line was fixed until this year. Uh, now we switch to the pay-as-you-go system. Uh, we set up return validators at our peers uh, because some of our uh, sea lines have more than one stop. Uh, on these lines, passengers getting off at the intermediate pier and passengers getting off the last stop no longer pay with the same fare. Uh, this is actually an uh, incentive to promote the use of uh, sea routes. Uh, 
Another example is following, we also operate a car ferry line in Bosphorus between Beykoz and Istinia districts. And if you have an electric car, you pay half price. Uh, as a subsidiary company of municipality, we are trying to encourage uh, the use of electric vehicles in such ways. Uh, this could be considered as kind of uh, incentive, I think. Although uh, there are such solutions in local governments, of course, we cannot talk about how they will accelerate this transition. Uh, on a larger scale, the central government also has responsibilities to promote the use of electric vehicles, especially to uh, electric prices to be used in public transportation should be encouraging. Uh, some uh, incentive mechanisms should be discussed at the state uh, level as well. And last, uh, I want to repeat, even if it is not possible to renew all the mass transportation vehicles, uh, and, we, and if we manage uh, to renew our ferry fleet uh, with price intensive, it would be possible to increase the share of the clean mass of uh, transportation that will contribute to decarbonization a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so you are indeed uh, trying to bring in uh, very different uh, pricing tools uh, and also factoring in uh, the longer term uh, cost savings uh, in your uh, plans towards the uh, vessel uh, fleet upgrading, etc. So I would be very interested to to follow on uh, what Istanbul is achieving in this in this regard. Um, so this, this, we talked a little bit about the intersection of the energy and transport, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Samir Quatra, uh, the policy director for India and International Program at Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, pr who brings over two decades of experience in multi-sectoral approaches to clean energy um, and climate policies in India and beyond. Um, Samir, um, India has set out very ambitious uh, government, uh, with, with strong government leadership, a program towards uh, clean energy and electrification, uh, including the EV30 at 30 uh, campaign, which is to achieve 30% of uh, EV market share by 2030. How do you see this uh, being achieved? Are there enough um, incentives for the market to shift? Thanks, Chen. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, India indeed, indeed has you know steep goals for decarbonization overall. 2070 net zero. Um, very strong uh, focus on renewable energy and clean energy transition, including electric mobility. So this 30 percent share of electric vehicles by 2030 target came with an announcement of incentives. To, to reduce upfront cost of electric vehicles, especially in a certain vehicle segments, two wheelers, three wheelers, uh, and public transportation as well. So India had announced this uh, um, faster adoption in the manufacturing of electric vehicle scheme, FAME, um, and it, there has been two phases of it, you know, first one in 2015 and then 2019. Um, so there are incentives and subsidies for uh, for manufacturing and adopting electric vehicles. There are also um, tax incentives. You know, India has a, a sales tax regime that incentivizes some of these uh, electric uh, mobility choices. There are regulations. You know, the suite of policy tools that you know, Joe earlier presented on that slide. So a lot of those are already uh, available. There is, uh, you know, there's regulation on tailpipe emissions, for example, which is pretty stringent. Um, Twenty, more than 20 states in India have electric vehicle policies instituted. So, you know, clearly there's the demand side push as well. Um, and yet, you know, while there has been an improvement in the share of electric vehicles in 2021, about two percent of the total sales were uh, electric. And now we're close to five percent, and and yet if you see, you know, thirty percent is is a steep target in a country that is rapidly urbanizing. You know, where people, where transportation um, is 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 uh, you know is aspirational, and more and more people are choosing to adopt um, you know automobiles and vehicles. So it's it's not going to be easy. There are certain opportunities that I'd like to highlight, though. Um, 
One is, you know, a lot of electric mobility so far focus has been in, in the large cities because it goes hand in hand with charging infrastructure, as you know. You know, and the challenges of electrifying a major energy use area in a in a developing country, which where electrification itself is a work in progress. You know, India's electric grid hopefully will double by 2030. That's the projection. So when the country itself is electrifying, you know, the challenges of electrifying transportation are unique and you know different than you would see here in the U.S., for example. Um, so what happens is that the electric mobility focus has hasn't yet percolated to tier two cities to to villages in india where transportation is is a huge challenge you know a lot of people we did a survey and our dc and our partners in villages in india and their primary mode of transportation is walking you know so, so they are yet to get their first vehicle and forget about you know electric vehicles and they don't have um, I india has electrified most of its villages and yet you know there is uh, reliability and 24-7 uh, availability of uh, power and charging are are still work in progress, like I said. So you know, percolating, uh, creating the ecosystem for electric mobility to tier two cities, to villages is, is going to be you know, a big focus. And then it, it going with the overall decarbonization goals, it isn't just about you know, using the current grid, uh, which has a high carbon emission factor. Uh, to power electric vehicles, right? So the renewable energy powered EVs uh, is going to be the next frontier as well. So there has again been you know, some policies, incentives. Can you procure renewable, renewable energy through open access without having to go through the grid um, and use that to power EVs? So you know, a new policy came out last year as well. Um, there is focus on on-site renewable generation, you know, uh, you, and there are buildings that incentivize charging infrastructure based on rooftop solar, for example, in certain pilot cities. And yet, you know, there's a potential to do more there. Um, and then finally, you know, it's uh, a lot of focus on, of incentives has been on certain vehicle segments, you know, two wheelers, three wheelers, public transportation. But it, this could be expanded to cover all vehicle segments in India. For example, and there's a new LBNL report that talks that 2% of uh, vehicles are in medium to heavy duty trucks in India, and yet they contribute 40% of total emissions. So you know, having those demonstrations, creating incentives and policies, um, which goes also to my point earlier about you know, the rural mobility bit in villages, uh, there is need for innovation, having vehicles that are more suited for in you know, that segment of population um, and also agricultural segment so focus comprehensively on transportation um, powering evs through renewable energy um, and you know focusing on beyond the major cities are some of the opportunities that i see in india cannot top um, thank you, Samir. I think this really sums up uh, the developing countries have to achieve both climate goal and development goals, right? So um, that those challenges uh, that, that we are grappling with. Um, I would like to explore more. I mean, what, what are the existing market structure actually enables, you know, these changes and what where where we are falling short? But hopefully we can discuss a bit more on that. I'd like to invite Dr. Austin uh, Brown, who formerly was an executive director for UC Davis Policy Institute uh, and held various positions at the Department of Energy, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under the Obama administration. I understand that you are back at the White House as the senior director for uh, transporta transportation emissions um, at the uh, Office of Domestic Climate Policy. So Dr. Brown, um, in high-income countries like the US, um, maybe a bit different context from the developing countries that we are talking about, uh, transport sector emissions take up a very large share of the total emissions, uh, and yet high level of motorization and car dependency make it difficult uh, to reduce uh, the emissions. Do you see some forms of pricing incentives playing a role uh, in this? And uh, what are some of the levers that the federal government uh, can do to introduce um, uh, in this endeavor? Thanks, and thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I think in the United States, and I'll really just speak to that experience, we know that 
Um, you know, there's been a lot of focus on vehicle electrification because the motorization rate is so high and it's clearly an indispensable tool, right? We can't get there if we don't get to these zero emission vehicles as rapidly as possible. It's been a huge amount of policy focus and investment there. Um, but I think everybody who studies transportation seriously and even people who just sort of experience the system around them know that just that one-to-one -one swap isn't going to get us where we need to go. It's not going to get to decarbonization quickly enough. And then I think more important, it does nothing to address the other challenges associated with transportation. Um, some of the local uh, air pollution, but then I think more noticeably, more pointedly, uh, congestion and then equity of access, who can afford to drive and who can afford to access vehicles. Um, we, I think, uh, know now that we're in a situation where um, we've sort of created a lack of choice in the transportation ecosystem in most communities in the United States. So other than a handful of, of cities, um, there really isn't a practical choice other than owning and operating a personal vehicle in terms of being able to get around. And one of the reasons that we see that a direct pricing mechanism, sort of as we talked about earlier, doesn't have that big of an effect on transportation choices is that there aren't those <laughs> practical decisions, practical choices barely exist. We can't make a one-to-one -one swap and say, instead of driving, I'm gonna use this other mode in most places in the United States. It's, you're not just doing a swap, you're also sacrificing personal freedom, flexibility, and a ton of time. And when you add up that financial incentive of whatever you want to call it, any form of pricing or you know, even the fuel taxes and the fuel prices, um, it just doesn't stack up compared to the time and convenience that people are being asked to, to, to trade in. Um, we know from you know, some communities in the United States and many uh, throughout the world that there are other ways to do it and that if we do provide those choices, if we do provide a system where you have a practical choice of being able to get somewhere as fast or faster on um, rail, on, uh, on, on bus transit, um, or via biking and walking, which in, in many communities becomes a, a, a real possibility, um, people will do that if they feel safe and if they feel like they're able to, to make those choices. So a lot of our focus, I think, in the United States needs to be on making the investments upstream to make those uh, mode choices much more easy and make them the easy and the default choice in a lot of different places. Um, we see that once you are able to um, easily make a choice for a trip via walking, biking, and rail, um, people like to do that. Most of us don't get in the car because we particularly like to drive. We get there because it's that offers that rapid and flexible service. Well, if we can bring in those investments um, to bring that about, then I think that it leads to a much more um, practical shift and a real choice uh, in, in communities for people to be able to choose those, those are other options. And then we can see the incentives start to align around choosing the lower cost option, the more convenient option, also happens to be the lowest carbon option. Um, and that is, I think, the kind of alignment that we need to create here. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think this point of uh, inelasticity of transport demand uh, with respect to pricing uh, is really a critical, one of the critical constraints, and, and we need to provide the, the alternatives. Uh, finally, let me introduce Dai Jong uh, Liu. Thanks for waiting. Uh, the director of the Sustainable Cities Program of the World Resource Institute. Uh, who brings over 20 years of experience in sustainable urban and transport development uh, and served various positions, including at the United Nations uh, Consultative Transportation Committee, World Transportation Conference, and many others. Uh, he's also a renowned public speaker on the topic of sustainable cities. So yeah, we went around the table. Yeah, we talked about pricing incentives uh, in the context of urban mobility, uh, ferry services, uh, transition to rural electrification, um, and also uh, creating the alternatives uh, to decarbonize. What are we missing here? Can you fill the gaps? Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, as, uh, I want to talk about the, the, the potential of the carbon market for uh, promoting the global efforts towards the carbon neutrality. Uh, for example, let's talk about China. China recently announced their uh, climate goal for carbon neutrality by 2060. And the first thing is they are launched the uh, manda uh, mandatory uh, compliance carbon market for the energy supply sectors. And they will launch another uh, voluntary uh, market, carbon market, uh, soon, uh, maybe middle of the, this year. Uh, so the uh, voluntary uh, carbon market will be more focused on the consumption side, like the transportation, uh, similar as uh, Europe, the ETS2, or the building sectors. So this is the first thing that we're thinking, the carbon market can be very much to support China's goal to the uh, climate ne neutrality. But the problem is when we're talking with the local uh, people, they're thinking 
the success very much depend on the scale of the market and how many translation per day, the volume per day for the market. This is why we are thinking about the cross border, the carbon market. For example, uh, uh, now we are discussing the Hong Kong uh, integrated with uh, Guangdong province on the building sectors. The, the, the developer from Hong Kong are very much work on this kind of cross-border market. They can increase the volumes and also the scale of the market. Uh, they are very much focused on the building, like uh, Tokyo. And we also thinking about the US and China. Maybe we can, <laughs> we can think about the bilateral, the, the, the cross-border uh, market. Uh, we understood that uh, the tension between China and the US in a national level but we're still thinking they have a lot of a possibility in the sub-national levels. For example, in China, we have a Bay Area, and in the US, you also have a Bay Area. So these two Bay Areas already build a very strong the green corridor about the shipping. But why not we move forward to build a cross-border like uh, the, the two barriers uh, about the carbon trade market for the transportation? This is one purpose. Actually, we already discussed with the Ministry of uh, Environment in China. They, they, are, they love these ideas. So we still need cooperate on the climate issue between China and the US. Maybe the subnational can be the opportunity. And the, so the, 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 the issue is, if we want to cross the border to do build the carbon market for the transportation, uh, I, I think the data sharing and the information disclosure and also the, the MRV will be very challenging. Uh, currently, we organize some uh, workshop between China and the, uh, and the European country on the CBM. They just launched the CBM. Uh, it's a carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. And they are, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the car makers in, in China, they, they're thinking about the export the, the, the EV car to, to Europe. And the main barrier is the data sharing the, 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 the information disclosure. So they are discussing a lot of around for that's the issues. So I think if we are thinking broadly uh, to talk about the cross borders, the carbon market, that the data, the information will be the critical key elements we need to talk about. So the last one I thinking, this kind of cross border, the carbon market, maybe crazy uh, the ideas, but I still thinking this is good for our climate cooperation. And at the meantime, we, we will create a new uh, business model or economic development model that can still uh, strengthen our economic ties. So this kind of a proposal. <laughs> Anybody would like to react to this? <laughs> Too big, huh? So, um, yeah, I think what you are talking about in terms of the data and information issues, I think that's uh, also quite important, right? So the voluntary carbon market and some of the lessons, I think, in, in pilots uh, uh, is that, you know, the have to have a strong uh, system of uh, monitoring and reporting and verifying the carbon emission reduction uh, as the foundation of the of the carbon market and in many situations I think uh, there are a lot of work uh, still to be done uh, in this front so um, I don't know if we have some questions online uh, or we can uh, open uh, up for discussion for the audience to to come in there's a microphone uh, if you would like to ask any questions to the panel. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Dominic, Dominic Englert. I'm an economist in the Global Transport Unit at the World Bank here. Thank you so much for the um, in, uh, intriguing discussion. Um, behavioral changes in carbon pricing, this is something that has always been very close to my heart. And I've got one specific question for Joe and for, uh, for CNEM um, online. For Joe, it is um, one of the issues that I've always seen with carbon pricing uh, in transport is, especially if we break it down to uh, prices at the pump, gasoline, for example, diesel, and so on, is that the carbon price would, be, would need to be so extremely high um, uh, to induce any behavioral uh, shift, at least if we apply a carbon tax or a levy or so, and not an emission, or also within an emission trading system, uh, would be the same. 
what can we uh, and that is all and that has also been one of the reasons why um, for example the EU ETS at uh, the European Commission has been so reluctant to include um, uh, transport um, uh, in the emission trading system is there any way uh, um, how we can um, deal with this or is it just better maybe to uh, to revert to regulation in order to um, drive more efficient engines, less less kilometers on the road, and so on. And the second question to uh, Emma is, is for you, Sinem. Um, you said that you reduced the fare by 99% um, and increased ridership uh, tremendously. As I said, I'm very much interested in behavioral changes. And there is a concept in behavioral economics that is the power of zero um, uh, that really says kind of when stuff is for free, then people go for it like crazy. However, if it costs just five cents or 10 cents or 50 cents, although this is a fraction of the price, people are very, very reluctant to use it. What is the reason why you didn't go all in and uh, you didn't go for the power of zero? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, Thanks, Dominic, and, and uh, excellent questions. And I don't know if I have answers answered to it, but um, a, a couple of responses. The first is that complementary policies, and when I say complementary policies, I mean complementary to carbon pricing is critical, right? And so you've, we've seen um, there's a number of studies where, you know, in, uh, significant investment in public transport systems and, and was touched on as well in terms of having modal choice can greatly influence the price elasticity of greenhouse gas emissions in transport sector. And that there, there are sort of studies that, that show that. Now, is it sufficient, is it sufficient to get to the, the types of um, uh, reductions that we need, um, as well as not being punitive to, to those most vulnerable? Um, and I, I think that there's still a question there. Um, I think that um, education around the role of carbon pricing is also important. Um, it sound, it's often on the periphery of the, the economics discussion, but there are a lot of studies, um, largely in, in developed countries, where um, the public knowledge of what those uh, what what the incentive is and what it's trying to achieve, like the, the objectives, can actually influence help influence behaviour. So, so I think that, that there is a role in that as well. And the last one is last point I wanted to m mention is that uh, that the the importance of of um, dealing with distributional impacts on the community. And so, and that's not about subsidizing fuels. Um, it's about understanding the, the cost and the impost on, on consumers and, and working out ways to, to ensure that, um, or to address some of those disadvantages through um, maybe, uh, you know, income tax transfers or, or other sorts of transfers, I think. Um, but I, as a sort of a general point, um, that you do need to consider in in specific country contexts whether or not carbon pricing is the right policy. So I completely agree, um, and not just in in transport, but in in all sectors, is the uh, is the local context, the uh, the 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 market environment, the uh, the consumer responses um, um, going to get the outcome that you need, and is the is carbon pricing the right policy? And I think that has to be critically assessed on on an individual basis. Um, and I think to date, uh, personally, I think that um, you know it's debatable whether or not um, carbon pricing is going to be um, effective, um, given the technologies that we currently have and the complementary policies that we current, currently have, in in particularly in emerging economies that are dealing with not just the climate and social problem, but also development and economic um, aspects as well. So there's my non-answer for you. <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. <laughs> Uh, Sine, would you like to come in yes. on the zero yes. price? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, the, the question also we um, get discussed on it because it is um, also applies the other modes. It's also related with the other modes. Modes. Uh, what I mean, the uh, railways. And metros and buses, etc. Because we are the substair of substair company of municipality, and uh, our prices uh, belongs related with all modes. So it's a 
policy and political issues. Uh, I cannot decide that uh, by alone. <laughs> uh, I think it's very, very, very useful to free um, fee, but uh, we are still discuss on it because it's very uh, political issues in uh, Turkey and municipality. Thank you. Um, next in line, please introduce um, Hello, thank you for your conference. Um, my name is Paul Reyes. Um, I have a question about, I feel that most of the topics have been at uh, state level and, or, and uh, collaborations at the international level. Um, I was wondering if you have explored um, facilitate or creating regulations or policies that will incentivize companies to create incentives in, at the local level. So, for example, um, in a case that I saw a few years ago was when uh, there was a uh, need to create or to build a, a parking lot for uh, employees of a company. And I went to the CFO and I said, like, instead of building this, this, uh, this uh, parking lot, why don't we use that money to create incentives for the people who are, you know, for the employees? And, you, and you keep, we keep the money and we provide incentives for people to use their bikes or other forms of transportation. And he's like, yeah, it's a great idea financially, but nobody's going to do it. So I wonder if there is like a, if, if, if that's the case, uh, if it has explored at all, uh, helping uh, companies and um, at the local level create uh, these types of uh, incentives. Thank you. Yeah, we can take one more question. Thank you. <laughs> it was like very, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I'm an economist. Uh, so for me, it, it, it runs in my veins, right, uh, pricing. However, when we have market failures, prices might not be the best indicator that align our preferences with what's happening there, right? I'm very interested to hear from you the non-pricing mechanisms used for changing behaviors. I think uh, um, Mr. Jifu mentioned some. And definitely uh, Mr. Quatra mentioned another one, right? But I would like to hear, in our studies that uh, we have done here, we learn that in China, one of the most effective mechanisms to avoid the use of very pollutant vehicles is not a pricing mechanism. It was the green tag, right? that uh, will basically uh, um, create incentives not to go to the center of the cities, right? And I think you mentioned some of that in terms of, well, parking, you have parking, but incentives to change behaviors. Um, the other one in the United States for the trucking industry, the smart way is one of the most effective ways to decarbonize trucking. And it was basically creating incentives to compete right, in adoption of new technologies and being innovative and being certified as we are green and that creates kind of a different type of incentives. So, but I didn't hear that much here. You kind of mentioned here and there. Could you please elaborate a little bit more given that pricing we have heard might not be that easy? Thank you very much. I think we can try to answer these two questions. I mean, I don't know how many questions Cecilia asked, but <laughs> so, okay, okay. So very effectively targeting three of our panelists. Um, yeah, so one was on how do we incentivize companies, businesses to take actions at the local level, uh, doing right projects, and what are non-pricing um, incentive mechanisms to complement pricing? So who would like to start? I try to to, to just run. Okay, um, uh, I agree. So we we should think about the non-pricing mechanism. But indeed, in the case of China, we're still using the pricing mechanism. If, for example, the EV uh, electronic vehicles in in China's market last year is increasing dramatically, nearly double. Okay, it's uh, in total is around seven million electric vehicles into the market last year. However, this, uh, uh, the market there is means 
the technology increased a lot because the people using the, the electric vehicles is much cheaper than the traditional uh, congestion engine, right? And also, also like the city in Beijing, if you use the electric vehicles, you can go anywhere. Okay, this is non pricing. Yeah, that's non pricing. If you use the congestion vehicles, you cannot go to the the, the, the city center or the, the parking pricing is very high, something like that. Okay, and uh, in uh, another another gentleman's question is how to local localization of the tradings. Uh, I, I totally agree. This, if you trade the, the carbon reductions for the, 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 the transport, it's too little. In the case of Beijing, if you use the green transport modes for, for trips, meaning it's only a few cents in the trade market. Okay? In, in renminbi, not, not, not US dollars, the local. Okay? So uh, it, 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 it's very, very little effect influencing the, the people's behavior, right? What we did is we encourage the internet platform to give more, okay? So they, they collect the carbon, trade back the money, and additionally, they, the, the, the provider provide more gifts to the individuals. The, the internet provider has the, 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 the interest because he can use this kind of activity to, to attract the more, more users. He can gain the, 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 the benefits from these activities. And the government like it because it can encourage people to use more greener transport modes. So that's the, 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 the mechanism. And uh, in the future, we are still thinking to, to, to set up a personal account, the credit, carbon credit account. The people can use that credit for the right of the use of the roads, the transport, in a greener way in the future. That's it could be a, a, a larger range of the options that can be think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can add a couple of great questions. Um, so on, on the corporate front, you know, that's super important because you know, corporations, large organizations have a big footprint, have huge fleets. So there are examples in India you know, where cities incentivize last mile delivery, for example, logistics through electric mobility. Some of those are there, much more needs to be done. But I do want to go into the non-pricing mechanism, but we have to think of a different part of the world altogether where behavior change is very different. You know, while, like you know, Austin mentioned, in America, we want to give people the choice to walk. The world that I'm coming from, we want to tell people that there are options other than walking and biking. You know, that it's not a compulsion, it's not a necessity. You can go from point A to point B without spending an entire day or, you know, carrying heavy loads on your bicycle and, you know, still make a living sustainably. So it's a very different behavior change. And other than electric mobility, we also work on, you know, a host of other solutions in villages in India. And I'm reminded of, uh, you know, two things that We've, I discovered which touched me a lot in terms of migrating people from using diesel to electric solutions for irrigation, for example, solar-based water pumps for irrigation. So um, one thing people told, one, one big incentive is convenience, you know, and people said that, uh, women especially, you know, in our interviews said that they had trouble cranking the diesel generator, going there in the morning, and you know, having uh, the setup for irrigating the fields. But now they have these solar panels and the you know, solar-based water pumping solutions. They just need to press a button. You know, so it's more equitable, they can do it, you know, and so convenience. And then they had to go long distances. Uh, we work with, you know, in this remote area in India, which is a salt marsh, and people had to go long distances to get kerosene for, for their lighting, for diesel, for their motorbikes. 
but you know if they have battery swapping solutions for example if they have you know electric two vehicles powered through the local microgrid then they don't have to travel those long distances there there's no need for setting up you know oil and gas pipelines and infrastructure to get into that part of the world so convenience is another primary driver creating those options those choices are you know there are so many other things the pricing is also very important i have to come back to that though we are eating into the coffee break, so I'll give you two minutes to Daejong, I don't know, and uh, Austin, if you want to come in two minutes. I will be very quick. So, so besides uh, the pricing, we're thinking the right of the way is a uh, very important thing to, to change the behaviors. For example, like London's low emission zone and in China, they have more than five cities already applied kind of uh, uh, right of way. This government can do, and the only people use the bicycles, use the e tracks can oh, going to that you don't need the money. And the second thing response to that uh, private sector, the the, com the companies, this is why I thinking the carbon trade market is important. For example, post the uh, COVID, the, the public transit, the bus company is uh, really very bad, the, the, the economic issues because uh, the ridership dropped off almost 30% in China after the, the COVID. So this is why we want to build the voluntary the carbon market for transportation companies, they are not so ticket anymore. They are so the carbon. So that means sometimes they create more profitable for the company to survive after the, 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 the COVID. So this is the thing. We, we want to change the business model that can, 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 can spur the economic growth. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel uh, for the discussion. It's a complex, difficult topic to, to deal with, and uh, we really appreciate this diverse perspective that you brought uh, today to today's discussion. And thanks to the audience uh, for your interest. In, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.